Hi, this is History with Andrew Allen, and today is episode 10 of my series on the Mexican Revolution, the Punitive Expedition, also known as the Hunt for Pancho Villa. Before I forget, I include the names of the people I talk about and my sources in the description. As I explained last episode, the civil war between Carranza and Villa had appeared destined to end with Carranza's defeat, but the fragile alliance between Villa and Zapata quickly dissolved, mainly because neither man made much effort to preserve it. Since Zapata was occupied introducing land reform to Morelos, Carranza's lead general Obregón was able to focus on Villa and several Bloody battles prove that Villa may have had a larger army, but Obregón was a much, much better general. By the end of December, most of the surviving Villistas had taken advantage of Obregón's offer of amnesty, so Villa and his few remaining followers rode into the mountains. Aware that American tycoons were pressing for an intervention to restore stability, a German operative persuaded Huerta to plan an uprising with Orozco, but he was arrested in Texas and died in an American prison, while Orozco was killed by a sheriff's posse. While Obregón had defeated Villa's army, Carranza faced two challenges, solidify his control over Mexico and rebuild the nation. A large-scale repair of infrastructure would not be cheap, but the treasury was empty. So where would he find the money? Believing that the agrarian reform that benefited small-scale farmers would hold back the national economy, he returned many of the haciendas that had been confiscated by Villa and his generals to their original owners, hoping that taxes on their large farms would provide his government with the funds needed to repair Mexico's damaged infrastructure. Rather than deal with regional strongmen which would involve distasteful actions such as negotiation and compromise, Carranza imposed governors on states who were from other regions. While the policy of assigning northern generals to be governors of southern states prevented them from building their own power bases, the cultural differences sparked conflict. Several of the northerners appointed governors of southern states were dynamic, self-made men, so they had little interest in the villagers' deep-rooted love of the land. While many southern leaders were politically conservative, they did enjoy genuine support from a populace that felt that their states were being mistreated by a distant central government. The refusal to even acknowledge local power brokers meant that Carranza's control of some areas was often superficial. The local power brokers did not always meekly accept a northern carpetbagger, and several rebellions flared up in the south. Carranza's brother Jesus had been sent to pacify Oaxaca, but was captured and executed in July 1915. A more conciliatory approach might have manipulated local factions into accepting central control in exchange for a degree of local autonomy and privilege for the leaders. But Carranza did not do conciliatory approaches. Aside from the conflict caused by abrasive occupiers, Carranza's control of Mexico was far from firm. Morelos remained stubbornly independent, while nearby Guerrero was divided between local factions with only superficial links to Zapata and Carranza. Moreover, the refusal to compromise with locals had consequences. The Cedillo family had initially tried to work with Carranza in San Luis Potosi, but had sided with Villa during the Civil War. Following his repeated defeats, the Cedillistas, followers of the Cedillo family, had returned to San Luis Potosi. Although the Carancistas controlled the main towns and the railway lines, the Hacendados did not trust Carranza's generals to protect them, either from the Cedillistas or from looting by the generals, so they abandoned their estates. The Cedillistas worked abandoned haciendas and protected local farmers from the Carancistas so they won sufficient support to control a sizable part of the state. A fervent nationalist, Carranza refused to finance his army through foreign loans. Instead, generals had the authority to force locals to give loans to the military. Governors were often also in command of the armies in their provinces, and they used their control of those armies to enrich themselves. Since only the rich were targeted, they naturally tried to forge connections with the generals to ensure their safety and the smooth operation of their businesses, which fueled corruption. 
In addition, the uncontrolled greed of Carranza's generals proved counterproductive. When Carranza and Villa fought each other, Manuel Pelez, a former supporter of Huerta, had returned to Tampico in October 1914, raised a small army of peons, farmers, and ranchers, and took control of the region. Desperate for oil to power their navy during the war, the British welcomed the stability he provided, and American oil companies also preferred Pelez's disciplined men to Carranza's troops. Another former follower of Huerta had worked with rich planters to make Yucatan autonomous from Mexico City, so Carranza sent Sonoran General Salvador Alvarado, who crushed the revolt, but also introduced progressive reforms. He even ended international harvesters' dominance of the Henneken market, forcing planters to sell to a government agency, which gave him money for patronage in the state. Carranza opposed his plans for land reform, but World War I had inflated prices for Henneken, and Alvarado wisely sent the central government enough tax revenue that Carranza grudgingly tolerated the reformist general. Speaking of Sonora, Plutarco Calles, governor of Sonora, made an effort to keep the larger mines operating to generate tax revenue. After Carranza defeated Villa, Calles and Adolfo de la Huerta encouraged labor to organize and establish a labor code that included a minimum wage and an eight-hour working day. It is important to stress that while Carranza's control over several regions of Mexico was weak, if non-existent, there was no organized national resistance. The Villista army in the northern states of Chihuahua and Durango had been destroyed, aside from a few bands of guerrillas. Zapatista-controlled Morelos was the only state where the federal government had no presence, since the Zapatistas had zero interest in exporting their agrarian revolution to other states. Carranza might have simply ignored them, except Morelos was located close to Mexico City. The reforms introduced by more progressive governors in states like Sonora, Tabasco, and Yucatan undoubtedly annoyed Carranza, but the governors were officially loyal to the central government and, more important, sent tax revenue to Mexico City, so it was an acceptable irritation. The most successful local factions, the Cedillo family and Pelez, only controlled parts of their respective states and were either unwilling or unable to leave their home territories. Carranza's main advantage was that the rebellions were truly local, so something resembling peace seemed possible. At least until Villa suddenly thrust himself back onto the national stage. Remember I mentioned that when Villa and his most loyal followers rode off into the mountains in late December, he was expected to have a short, dangerous life as a guerrilla before he finally met his end. Well, he had other ideas. Filled with bitterness by President Woodrow Wilson's decision to recognize Carranza's government, Villa swore to kill every American that he found. Troops nominally under his command executed 17 American employees of a mining company on January 17, 1916, although Villa initially claimed that it had been a misunderstanding. However, his next move would leave no room for misunderstanding. In early March, Villa led 400 men across the border towards Columbus, New Mexico, killing several American ranchers on the way. The garrison was taken by surprise on the morning of March 9th, but still drove off the Villistas. 18 Americans and possibly 100 Villistas died. There is evidence that elements of the German government had been informed of the possibility of manipulating Villa, but there is no concrete evidence of a direct exchange of money and weapons in exchange for a promise of a raid. Moreover, Villa was motivated by a genuine feeling of betrayal by the United States. An invasion by a Mexican guerrilla, even a failed border raid, set off shockwaves in the United States. The border region had been stressful for months and President Wilson decided the next day that he would have to send troops into Mexico. Facing re-election in the fall, Wilson was duty-bound to be seen doing something. At the same time, he did not want to get dragged into Mexico's civil war, so he contacted Carranza and told him that the punitive expedition's sole objective would be to capture Villa. After a lengthy exchange of diplomatic messages, a furious Carranza knew that he could not stop the Americans, so he finally agreed. Commanded by Brigadier General Jack Pershing, the expedition entered Mexico with 5,000 men on March 15th. 
Although the American army had 108,000 men, the majority were on occupation duty in the Philippines, Hawaii, and the Panama Canal Zone, leaving only 24,000 in the United States. Carranza did not stop the expedition, but he did not permit American soldiers to use Mexican trains, so Pershing was limited to trucks, mules, and horses to transport and supply his army. A Dodge touring car was his sole luxury, Otherwise, he slept on the hard ground and used the light from his car's lamp. The terrain of Chihuahua was filled with arid desert, rocky mountains, and hundreds of caves and canyons, but little water, except during rainstorms, when canyons became death traps. Despite horrible conditions, Pershing persevered, leading his men 350 miles deep into Mexico. Aware of the physical needs of his men, Pershing did not cracked down on dice games, and even permitted a sanctioned whorehouse at the Expedition HQ, where the men and the prostitutes were inspected regularly for venereal disease. American detachments spread out looking for Via, but genuinely found dust and discomfort. Sometimes they came across Viistas, sometimes they encountered Carranza's troops, who were increasingly hostile, even though Carranza had ordered his generals to not start a war. Carranza's generals Trevino and Murguia were already hunting Villa's men but had little success, probably because many soldiers were former Villistas who did not look very hard. By the end of April, the Villista threat was clearly over, even though Villa had not been captured. Both Secretary of State Lansing and Secretary of War Newton Baker recommended withdrawing the army, but Wilson kept the expedition there to pressure Carranza. To be honest, the American army could have patrolled the border region, which would have prevented more raids and not further weakened Mexican serenity. Although Wilson repeatedly said that he would never declare war since he had grown up around the devastation of the Civil War, he kept sending American armies into Mexico on flimsy excuses, which then led to shootings and dead Mexicans and Americans and calls for war. The expedition had failed to find Villa because he had been wounded during a skirmish on March 27th and hid in a remote cave while he recovered. When Villa emerged after two months, he found that most of his followers had been killed, captured, or simply deserted. Hoping to restore his reputation, he organized a second raid on the United States in May. Tired of a foreign army wandering around northern Mexico, Carranza responded to news that more American forces had crossed the border by formally warning Pershing to return home or fight federal troops. Wilson's reaction was to call up the National Guard for service in Mexico, but it would take time to organize the movement of National Guard units from all over the U.S. to the southern border. Given the rise in tension, war seemed unavoidable after a battle between American and Mexican forces broke out at the small town of Carrizal on June 21st when Captain Charles Boyd led 86 men into the town. Mexican machine guns killed 23 Americans, including Boyd, and another 24 were taken prisoner. Pershing initially hoped that it would become a cause for war, but soon learned from the survivors that Boyd had disobeyed orders to avoid trouble with Mexican troops by not entering towns with federal garrisons. In the end, neither Wilson nor Carranza wanted a war, so both leaders kept their armies under control and Carranza ordered the release of the prisoners. To prevent further escalation, Pershing was told to stop the patrols and to place his army in two base camps while the diplomats settled things. 6,000 men were stationed near the Mormon settlement at Colonia Dublin, and the other 4,000 men were at El Valle, 65 miles away. Chinese merchants quickly appeared at Dublin to operate laundry and sweet stands, while cantinas and brothels set up just outside the perimeter. While it seems pointless to keep 10,000 troops in Mexico just sitting around, Wilson may have kept the Pershing expedition in Mexico longer than necessary to handle Republican criticism right before the presidential election. In addition, he may have kept the army in Mexico as leverage to persuade Carranza to make concessions regarding American-owned property in Mexico. Why were such harsh measures necessary? As I explained in episode 1, foreigners, largely American, controlled most Mexican mines and oil fields. Tired of foreign dominance of these key industries, Carranza had levied steep 
export taxes on mines on March 1, 1915. This was a significant matter since Mexico produced one-third of the world's silver. When mine owners, both foreign and domestic, ceased operations rather than pay the taxes, he simply threatened in September 1916 to seize the mines which encouraged payment of the tax. All of these decrees had been fiercely protested by American Secretary of State Robert Lansing, and the constant anti-Americanism had been a key factor in the decision to organize the punitive expedition. However, Carranza was equally stubborn and had guessed correctly that Wilson would not go to war. Moreover, Wilson felt war with Germany was impossible to avoid and did not want to get stuck in a pointless conflict in Mexico. Again, an acceptable approach, but he still kept an army in Mexico for 11 months, poisoning Mexican views of the U.S. In case you were wondering about Villa, he reappeared and resumed attacking Carranza's men in early September, which was a profound embarrassment to both the men in the expedition and the federal Mexican army. Wilson gave up in January 1917, claiming that a federal victory over Villistas at Torreon meant that federal troops had regained control over the border area. The American army was back at Columbus, New Mexico by February 5th, thus ending the punitive expedition without having captured Villa. To sum up, despite the near total destruction of Villa's army, Carranza's rule was unstable since a refusal to negotiate with local power brokers had caused revolts to break out in several states. Still, something resembling peace was possible until a bitter Villa attacked Columbus, New Mexico, which led to the punitive expedition, where an American army marched around northern Mexico hunting Villa for almost a year. A war between Mexico and the United States was barely avoided, but the Americans failed to capture Villa, who returned to guerrilla warfare. Aside from the threat of an American invasion, Carranza was also the most recent in a series of Mexican presidents who had to deal with the Zapatista revolt, as well as the need to write a new constitution, which I will discuss next episode. Thanks for listening.